So hi everyone, it's Nina Collins here at The Wolfer. And today we're in conversation with author Nina Restieri, who's a wolfer and the author, oh, sorry, the author of a book called Overcoming the Mom Life Crisis, Ditch the Guilt, Put, your, put Yourself on the To-Do List, Create a Life You Love. Welcome, Nina. Hi. Hi, <laughs> Nina. So nice to be here. Can you hold up a copy of your book? I see one behind you. I'm sorry. Normally I have one with me and I don't today. So this book just came out this month. You can buy it on Amazon and all places where you can buy books, Overcoming the Mom Life Crisis. Great. So Nina is a mom of four, like me. We're two Ninas with moms, moms of four. Um, you live in Connecticut, I believe. And um, your background is as a kind of stay-at-home mom and an entrepreneur. You started a business called Mom Agenda. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what that is first? So um, when my kids were young, I was a state. So my background was in advertising and marketing. And then after I had my second child, I decided to stay home with my kids. And then I had two more kids. And I was home with my kids for six years. Um, and I was kind of, I was like a hot mess mom, like missing play dates and doctor's appointments and just couldn't get my act together, which is probably because I had four kids. Yeah. I had under four seven. Kids. Yeah. So, <laughs> I, had, I had four um, under six and it's a lot. Yeah. I get it. So I created this system to get myself organized and um, I realized I started talking to a lot of moms and I realized that it could probably help other moms too. So in 2005, I started mom agenda. I started creating these day planners that are meant for moms of multiple kids. Mm -hmm. And, um, I thought it was going to be my little hobby that I did, you know, raising kids and do this little thing on the side and it took off. So, um, uh, so yeah, that was 16 years ago. Amazing. So it's a company of planners for moms. I make day planners, day planners, other organizing products. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. I looked at the website. It's very impressive. When I had young kids at home, um, I had a giant, you know, those giant calendars that you get at like Staples, those big yeah. white ones. And I had one in the kitchen counter and we had color coded, you know, for each kid, oh, yeah. yellow, yeah. pink, blue, whatever. And, you know, babysitters and classes and yeah it was quite the production I have to say it's chaos right um, <laughs> it's so, hard. so and now you've written a book called overcoming the mom life crisis right so this is say I guess 15 years after you created that business your kids are now like most wolfers they're kind of in their early 20s um and this is a crisis that you describe in the book taking 10 years for you to kind of figure out how to put yourself first. And I hope I'm not spoiling anything by saying that you get divorced in the process, um, because I think that's a common or not an uncommon experience for mothers who feel like they're really struggling um, to kind of pull it all together. You describe in the book kind of having the perfect life, what looks like the perfect life, and it's not the perfect life. And I think so many of us relate to that. I relate to that also. I also got divorced. Um, I guess almost 15 years ago when my kids were six, eight, eight, and 12. And I think at the time people thought I was insane. Like my life looked so perfect, you know, or ish anyway. Um, yes, Mary I can relate. I can relate yeah, to that. You know. Having the, the house and the picket fence and the kids yeah, and, and the kids and the guy who makes a lot of money and it all seemed perfect. And in fact, in my life, I mean, I was incredibly lonely and super unhappy with the marriage. So um, tell us a little bit about why you wrote this book. So I, um, I got divorced, as you know, and, and as, as you said, in your experience, it, it, was, um, it was very hard because people thought I was, people did think I was insane. My, my ex-husband is a great guy and... Um, I had everything and um, I, I felt lonely before the divorce, but I also felt lonely after like, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I had to make a lot of changes. And I think who I was when I was married versus who I am now, I mean, I, I've just done like a complete 180. And what I realized is if I had known all the things that I know now, when I was married, 
Well, I don't know what would have happened. Maybe I still would have gotten divorced, but I I would have stayed married. You know, things would have been different. And, but I learned these things after I got divorced and I went on this journey of discovery and it's like, oh, I want everyone to know these things so that maybe if they don't, maybe their marriage can be saved. Maybe they can be happy. Maybe they can be happy where they are and they don't have to go through this rock bottom period that I went through. Yeah, I went through too. It's interesting how common I think this is. And it's also a bit of just a commentary on women's lives in their 40s and 50s, I think. Um, Because you and I are the same age also. I'm going to be 52 this summer, you're 52. So, and I see women in their 40s, like I see women with younger kids who are feeling that fear about getting older and kind of fear about going into the next phase. But I also look at them and realize a lot of them are probably going to get divorced. They're going to like experience difficult things with their kids. Like I do think some of what we've gone through um, is pretty common. So, but tell us what you want women to learn. What did you learn? Well, what I really learned, and um, it started with a therapist who I talk about in the book. What I really learned is that this conditioning that I had been raised with that I had to put myself last Mm -hmm. was just not true and that it wasn't benefiting anybody. Um, It wasn't benefiting me. It wasn't benefiting my kids or my marriage. And that in fact, um, my happiness actually matters. Mm-hmm. Like that was such a news flash for me because you know I w- I was just raised with this mentality that when once you become a mom you kind of everything else doesn't matter anymore and you know you you put your kids front and center which I did and I still do but you don't have to put yourself at the bottom mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. you can still matter too so that's that's what I learned. That's really, your big, you know. that's truly really your big revelation. So it's interesting because I have to say I was raised by a single mom who was pretty, um, she was an artist and so she was pretty self-absorbed. She was a great mom in a lot of ways, but I definitely was raised with the message that you put yourself first. She put herself first. I've always been pretty good at saying like, I'm not good for anyone unless I'm taking care of myself. So um And sometimes I do think my kids think I've been selfish. I think even getting divorced, I think they think was selfish and they may be right. Um, But I am a much happier person than I was when I was married. Um, So that message of yours kind of ditch the guilt, put yourself on your to-do list. I don't need that message. Like I do feel like that is something I've always kind of intuitively understood. Um, There were a lot of other things I needed to learn. (laughs) about managing my own anger and kind of staying in my own lane, kind of, I think I acted out a lot and needed to learn how to kind of soothe myself basically. Uh Uh Um, But it's really interesting. I think what you're talking about is a very common thing that a lot of women really do struggle with. So how did you, how did you figure this out? How did you, you talk about seeing an acupuncturist and seeing like a plethora of experts. Um, What was your path like? Tell us a bit more. I mean, I saw so many different therapists and coaches and my acupuncturist and um, uh, my poor friends. I talked their ears off, you know. I, tell, tell us what your six pillars of self-care are. So the six pillars of self-care are are really like the basics. Like without them, it's it's very hard to take care of yourself. So, and they're more related to your physical body. Mm -hmm. So like, for example, I don't think we talk enough about getting sleep, you know, like I'm just a monster if I don't sleep for eight hours. Mm -hmm. And I am one of the lucky, very lucky women in their fifties who I do sleep. I sleep great. And I'm like a sleep sleep evangelist. I sleep now well too, because I went on, on HRT, but I always was a great sleeper also before, before menopause. Yeah, I, I've always been a great sleeper. I'm I'm not on anything. I sleep. I, I I'm very lucky. So you I want to- everyone to sleep as much as I do because <laughs> well, you know, there was a study last week that came out that lack of sleep in middle-aged people can lead to dementia. Like sleep. I is saw vital. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um all right. You know, so sleep is one of your pillars. Sleep is one of them. You know, what do you put in your body? Like I I really notice a difference if I if I 
had alcohol the night before, or if I had a lot of sugar, I'm not my best the next day. You know, like you're not going to be perfect, of course, with nutrition and whatever, but if, if we're shooting for being your best self, you want to like put things in your body that make you feel good. Totally. Lots of water, lots of vegetables. Like that's clear. Yes, exactly. Less red meat, no sugar. And now at this stage, is like I had a margarita last night and I woke up with a headache. I had one margarita. Like, I don't know what's happening as we get, like I used to be able to drink. <laughs> it's funny. I went through that in my late forties, but now I'm back being able to drink. <laughs> Thank God. I did go through a yes. phase where I couldn't really drink and I was super bummed. And I remember thinking to myself, had I known this was going to happen, I would have honestly had more to drink in my thirties, but now <laughs> I've come around again. I mean, I don't, I don't drink that much, but I drink one or two drinks a day, which is more than I should drink. And I don't wake up, wake up with a headache. So maybe it'll shift for you again. Oh, well, that gives me hope. Thank you. <laughs> Um, but I agree what you put in your body. And in fact, we, we posted, I posted an article today by Dr. Jen Gunther saying like, you know, all this talk about menopause trends, it, you know, it's kind of nice that people are starting to pay attention to us, but it's also a little bit of bullshit. Like the, the basics are pretty clear, eat better, exercise more. And as you say, get a lot of sleep. Yeah. And uh, you mentioned exercise. So like, I'm, I'm so, so much be- like, I never want to exercise, but when I do exercise, I'm just a happier totally. person, Me too. you know? And yeah. like, I think not just, not just for your body, but it helps your mood. Mm-hmm. For um, sure. Yeah. And that's one of the things my primary care doctor has always said to me since I've gone, since I started kind of perimenopause, it's like move, move, move. Like the more you move, the better you're going to feel. Yeah, no, I totally, and I used, you know, I used to run half marathons and like, I was like very gung ho. And now I've, I'm like, I take it easier on myself, but I've started strength training and it feels so good. I feel like so strong and powerful. It's like very much a mental empowerment thing. Yeah, I think that's true. Although it's amazing how quickly we lose it. Like I'm starting to have kind of saggier upper arms. Uh And it's like, if I really use weights, they look better. And then if I don't use weights for a week, they start to look worse again. Like it's definitely the muscle mass thing is real as we get older. Yeah, you really have to keep it up. Yeah. All right, so sleep, what you eat, exercise. Um, uh, Oh, I talk about meditation. Now, not everyone is into that, but I do think it helps, you know, even five minutes a day of like, just focus on your breathing. Everyone says, oh, I can't like, I can't um, block out my thoughts. You don't have to block out your thoughts. You just have to focus on your inhale and exhale. Um, And it helps me in terms of being more responsive rather than reactive. Mm -hmm. Um, Cause I can, I can be a little testy. So so if I meditate, I'm like, I don't have as much road rage. I'm not snapping at people. Like I can just be calmer. It's yeah. just five minutes a day. Yeah. No. And that's a real way to take care of yourself. I completely yeah. agree. Yeah. And what else? Are we missing anything? What else are we? Um... Oh, love and connection. So like call a girlfriend or you know, have sex with your partner, like connecting with people. I think that is one thing I kind of let go of when I was married. I didn't stay connected Mm -hmm. with my friends. I certainly wasn't connected with my then husband. My only connections at the time were really with my kids. I had a couple of good friends, but um, that's one thing I really learned in my mom life crisis is you really have to nurture your friendships. And like, and when I'm in relationships now, like I realize you have to take care of them every day. You can't just like, yeah, you can't just let them go on autopilot. No, it's certainly true. They all require work. And certainly the connection thing, obviously is a big part of the mission of the wolfer, right? It's like, we realize, and I see it all the time, how much women our age are craving connection and friendships and we really need it and obviously there's tons of evidence and studies to support how essential it is for well-being so um but I hear you your point about how easy it can be to forget probably particularly when we're in our 30s and early 40s like really running around with kids and kind of again it just comes back to like how are we nurturing ourselves how are we really taking care of ourselves right right and when you're when you're raised to when you're raised to say take care of everyone else first, 
your friendships can easily fall to the bottom of the list. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, because it just seems like that's an indulgence or a luxury. Um, so, so I now realize I really have to take care of my friendships and it's good for your health. And I agree with you. I also think that, um, it's so hard to make friends as an adult. So you really have to take care of the friends that you've made when you were younger, mm -hmm. you know, like in the Wolfer it's, I think it's super unique because we're able to make friends, but, uh, in our communities, it's, I think it's hard to make friends as an adult. Yeah, no, that's what women say. I mean, I don't find it that hard, but it's probably because I'm probably partly because of the community and because I'm always meeting interesting new women. But I agree. I mean, once your kids are out of school and you're not going to drop off and pick up, right, you're not in that setting, um, it can be tricky. I mean, I think some people, there are some women in the community who like during this, like talk about relationships in their synagogue or their church or through political activism or um but it does become harder. You know, it's in the same way dating. I mean, it's why dating apps have become so prevalent. It's hard to meet people. Um, have you ever used like, the, you know, Bumble has a thing called BFF, which is a way for women to make friends on Bumble. Um, that is I, so fun. I know those haven't become super popular yet, kind of dating apps for women's friendships, but they are kind of brewing. It's a um, good idea. Yeah, no, it is a good idea. I mean, it's it's def essentially a part of what we do for sure. Yeah. Um, the number of women who have made. How did you come to the Wolfer originally? Oh, I think I read the the profile in the New York Times. Mm, it, it was years ago. It was a few years ago. Yeah, yeah, it was like four or five years ago, I think. And I think I, you know, I read about you, and I definitely felt some. Uh, connection because I I too was raised by a single mom. My mom died young. Oh, really? Um, yeah. And I thought, oh, this is a person I think I relate to. I'm going to join this community. And it turned yeah. out it was all these amazing people who I, I feel like I relate to a lot of them. Oh, that's so great. Wait, how old were you when your mom died? I was 27. Okay. So yeah, really young. Yeah. And were you raised in a family when you talk about being taught that, um, you know, you came last, was it kind of like, what was your family life growing up like? Well, so my parents got divorced when I was very young and me my too. Mom, we have so many similarities. Yeah. It was, it was like me and my brother and my mom, us against the world, you know, and we were broke and it was I'm here. Same story. Yeah. It was, it was really hard, but we were happy. Mm -hmm. Um, and then and I think it, that was the beginning of that training where it was like the family, the, the family has to survive. So whatever needs you may have are, you know, mm. you kind of have to like, who cares? Because we, you have to put yourself last because the family comes first. And then my mom did get remarried. Um, and, uh, that wasn't so great for me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Same here. <laughs> so did your mom, do you feel like you ever saw your mom really putting herself first? Um, I think she said she did, but she, she talked about it and she said it, but she didn't do it. Mm. And, um, you know, she, I think one of the reasons she died young is that she didn't put herself first. You know, mm -hmm. she didn't really take great care of herself um, physically. And uh, that's one of the reasons that I talk so much about eating healthy and exercising and yeah. Yeah. You know, she, she, she said a lot of things, but she didn't act on them. And, you know, that's mm -hmm. one of the reasons I actually try to do the things that I say in my book. I, you know. Yeah, well, you have a great quote actually at the beginning of the book that I love. Um, if you don't like the road you're walking, start paving a different one. It's a Dolly Parton quote. Yeah. And it's something I really believe as well. Like, you know, I don't believe we can control everything in our lives, but I do believe that there's a lot we can control and we have to make decisions. And if we say we're going to do something, we have to do it because who else and is going to do that? And our kids are watching us. You know, I, yeah. I feel like our kids are. I learned from my mom how to put myself last and I had to unlearn all that. And I didn't want to pass that on to my daughter yeah, or my three sons, but especially my daughter. 
You know, I wanted my daughter to, to see me prioritizing myself as well as my children. Yeah, no, I agree. So there we're inverted. I have three daughters and a son. Um, But I do think that for whatever faults my kids find in me, I think that they, I'm really glad they have a model of someone who has really worked hard to kind of figure out her life and find happiness and has not settled for a kind of, um, you know, misery and depression. (laughs) I feel the same way. I want my kids to really, you know, Try to try to reach the kind of happiness that they deserve to have and not just yeah. settle for okay. Yeah. You know, totally. and if they're in a marriage where they're not happy and they're not having sex and they're not, you know, and they're depressed all the time, get you out. have to stay. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. life is short. Like, why wouldn't you be happy? Yeah, I agree. And so what's your life like now? Your kids are all gone. So, um, I have one still at home. My youngest is almost 18. He's a junior in high school. Mm -hmm. So I'm not an empty nester yet. Uh, I have one in college and two living in the city and, you know, on their own. All right. And And does mom agenda, sorry to interrupt, does mom agenda take up tons of your time? Like, is that your full-time job? It is. Okay. So that's that's busy. It's a lot. That's demanding. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm really, I'm really happy. I started mom agenda when I did, cause it gave me the freedom to get divorced, you know, like you. I do have my own thing. And that is one thing my mom always told me is to have your own money because yeah. she kind of got screwed over by my dad financially. Mm-hmm. Um, she never wanted that to happen to me. And I'm very grateful. I had that conditioning. Yeah. It's a great message. I agree. When people ask me my advice for younger women, I, I often say things like try and be entrepreneurial if you can be. Not everyone has that kind of um, temperament, but I think it's a really great way for women to live, to kind of run their own thing and have your own money and buy real estate early if you can. Like, I think there are certain things that women, and those are important things to model. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, being an entrepreneur really allowed me to be the kind of mom I wanted to be you know, to work when the kids were at school and be a mom when the kids were home. Although I talk about that in the book, it was very hard sometimes, you know, it was like having two full-time jobs. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot. It's a lot of work. Yeah. So what do you, what's next for you? You've written this book. Are you, what are you hoping the book will do? Where are you hoping you'll go next? You know, I would love to spend more time writing. I mean, mom agenda keeps me very busy, but, um, I might write about divorce next because I think I had a really good divorce and my ex and I are pretty close friends and my ex's wife and I are pretty close friends. And, you know, I, I had a, I always use this as an example. I had a really bad breakup a few years ago and my ex's wife was the one who called the guy in the middle of the night and yelled at him. Oh my God. An (laughs) asshole, you know? That's great. Wow. So, she would love you. That's awesome. Yeah, well, we're all close. We all have dinner every Sunday with the kids and whatever kids are around. And does we she just, have kids? The new she wife? She has two kids also in the same age range. So it's just a happy blended family. And I want, again, I want everyone to have that, you know, That's like. Great. I really envy you that. I do not really have that at, at all and wish I did. I mean, we're, we don't hate each other anymore, but his wife doesn't like me or want to talk to me. And, you know, it's sad. It really is sad. Good for you. You know, it's, thank you. It's, it takes two. I mean, that's, and that's the problem. And a lot of times the, the other person doesn't want to participate, but I have been very fortunate. You know, we're still a family. The kids, the kids are, um, you know, have that experience. So it's, it's been nice. So I might write about that. Beautiful. You should write about it. I mean, there's a wonderful wolfer named Gabrielle Hartley. I don't know if you've ever um, come across her, but she is a divorce mediator in Northampton, Massachusetts. And she wrote a book called Better Apart. And um, her whole, you know, idea is about peaceful, healthy divorces. And obviously, you know, I would wish that for anyone getting divorced. So I think it's important to model it and share your story. Um, That's great. Exactly. Better Apart says it all. It's like, you're good. He's good. 
you're just not good together. Exactly. Your kids are good. Yeah. Everyone's good. I mean, I think honestly, it's partly in my situation, my ex-husband, but I was also really, really angry and kind of crazy when I got divorced and it wasn't his, like, I just was unhappy and I was scared. And um, I mean, I think it was a lot about my own childhood, but I wasn't in a state where I could, I was so angry that he couldn't give me what I wanted or what I needed kind of love wise. Um, mm. Anyway, I, I regretted it. Better. Maybe. Yeah. yeah, it's yeah. it yeah. it can bring out the worst in us easily. Yeah. yeah, for sure. For sure. All right. Well, hold up your book one more time. Everyone oh, got sure. look for Nina Restieri's book, Overcoming the Mom Life Crisis. Um, it's just out and she's a wolfer, and we're really glad to talk to you. And I appreciate you taking the time. Thanks, Nina. I had a great time talking to you. And I hope I meet you in person sometime soon now that we're getting back to Nina. I saw on Instagram that you're in East Hampton and I'm going to be there. Oh, come when? In June and part of August. Okay, I'm in, uh, so Right just, in the same neighborhood as you. In Springs. Oh my God. We can go in for a spring. walk under our drive. That'd be great. Exactly. It totally texts me. You can, you know, whatever, email us, get my phone number. Obviously I'm easy to find, but um, please, I do that walk, run, rollerblade, bike. I Every literally day. had just said to my boyfriend, um, where can we go walking near our rental? And he said, we can go walking on Gerard Drive. And literally 10 minutes later, I was on Instagram and I saw your post saying that said oh Gerard God. Drive. That's I was so like, funny. oh my God, how is that even possible? And now COVID's, you know, almost over and we can, you guys come over and my boyfriend. Oh yeah. We have drinks. I'm vaccinated. I'm vaccinated too. Um, what fun, what street is your rental on? Do you know? Uh, I have to look it up. I'll text right. you. And, Whatever, yeah. text me. We'll definitely hang out this summer. I will be there. I'm going to Iceland for a week in June. Otherwise, I'm totally fun. around. Yeah, yeah. All right, great. Really fun to meet you, Nina. And nice I'll to see meet you. you. I'll see you this summer. Okay, bye. All right, take Thank care. You. Bye-bye.